Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob. Good to be back with you as always. I hope uh, that you've been doing well here. Um, So we're following up this episode with our previous episode that was with Matt Frad. And so listeners, uh, what Bob and I are hoping to do today is uh, we're going to actually break down uh, some of the things that Matt said, some of the highlights, some of the things that just really struck Bob and I. So if you're starting just with this episode and you haven't listened to the previous episode with Matt, uh, you might want to do that to get some context about things that we'll be referencing, et cetera. So, Bob, let's just start with general things that struck us from the episode with Matt. Anything just just generally that really that struck you from what he said in, in regard to the healing of pornography and compulsion and wounds in those areas? Well, a couple of things. One is I think the his honesty uh, of just, you know, things like, well, I was just attracted to seeing the naked woman, you know, cat yeah. woman, you know, just just his like childlike honesty at that stage, uh, yeah, and you know, all the way through. And I think the other thing is how young, you know, it's in your story too, and my story too, how young that trap gets set, and the yeah. innocence of a child at that age, even even though the act is not innocent, how innocent. At that age, you know those those things struck me a lot more. We can talk about as we go, but those two things at the beginning really hit me. Yeah, uh, the thing that struck me, I think it's it's it uh, bridges off of what you said. Was I uh, even still? I'm I'm just yeah, I'm just struck by the the woman in his life, the mom in his life, who condoned it. Like he even said, uh, this woman purchased pornography for he and his friend and it was the normalization i think of it and the normalization it's all it was almost like shameless yeah and i also in the midst of that really appreciated how matt hasn't like tossed her out the window figuratively speaking you know like he he said he still really appreciates her and has a great respect for her and they've they've broached some of these subjects and tried to experience some healing in those areas but that just absolutely, I, I, I didn't know how to process that. The, oh, sure, yeah, just just go for it. I, I was, yeah. honestly, I was waiting for the the negative turn of that somehow. I was waiting for that to blow up, right, in, in Matt's story, but it didn't. It didn't blow up in a way that I thought it would, so. And he really talked about her as a caring person in his life, right? Right, yeah. right. You know, I think it's something that maybe touches on, uh, I know, an area that you and I speak about a lot is I, I, what I think I'm doing. And so this is for a clinical term, this would be an example of projection or another way to put it, if you were actually in a therapeutic setting would be counter transference, which means I'm transferring my stuff potentially on to Matt's story. And so what I think it is, is that I'm expecting shame. Uh-huh. I think that's what I'm not. I'm expecting shame, but I'm not seeing it, or it, it, and and it's throwing me. I'm expecting that woman to be horrified at Matt and her son, but you don't see that. And so I'm just like, where's the shame? Where where where's the shame? I, I like, why is it the shame there? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I'm not necessarily saying I'm right yeah. in that. But but I think you. I think there is a place where the shame showed up. And it, what what he was conscious of was this woman saying it was okay, but notice he didn't bring it back and talk about it with anybody else. Wow. So there's there's a there's like a conscious level this is okay, and then there's an unconscious level this That's isn't okay, good. and I can't tell anybody. So I can say, and you you've seen this too as a as a therapist. I've never met anybody, no matter how much it's okay out here that deep down they felt it was okay in here because 
there's a there's a spiritual knowledge in the conscience that that, that says there's something in this that I need to hide. I, I know when I was in third grade and I looked at Playboy magazines, uh, I took them and hid them in the woods. Yeah. I, I knew that I couldn't share that. There was something right. in that, even though that was attractive, it was something in that that wasn't to be shared. Right. Isn't that really interesting how that seems universal? Now, I'm sure there's all kinds of people that have varying stories and argue that and go, oh, that's the culture and positions and blah, blah, blah. But I, I think the, the stance that, well, I know the stance that you and I take is that if you get deep enough and honest enough, and that's the that's the real the qualifier, deep enough and honest enough, there isn't a proudness at the utility of another human being. Yes. At just using a discarding. Yeah. So I, that's an interesting point you're making because now that you say it, I can I can totally see it that uh, Matt still did struggle with the, those areas of shame in his life. Yeah. And as we've, you know, we both have known and studied that it's shame that continues to drive the compulsion. And so uh, if there's no shame, there's no compulsion. And, you know, he was clear about the compulsion. Oh, wow. Wasn't just wasn't just the attraction. It's the shame connected to that that was driving him. And, and I think by the end of the sharing of his testimony, he talked about the freeing of that shame. You know, and that that was we can get to there in a minute. Bob, you're making I think a really important point that I'm not sure everybody will pick up. And you said the shame. If there's no shame, then there's no compulsion. And I, and I think that link is extremely important for people to see because one of the points that I think is very important to understand with regard to compulsion in the area of pornography, even compulsion in the area in other areas, but we're specifically talking about pornography addiction, masturbation addiction today, is that when you feel ashamed, you do something to make that go away. You try to make that better. And so the shame is need something to be done to it to make it better, which leads to the compulsion. Like I said in the last episode, a compulsion is just a repeated attempt to try to make something better. And then it, when it becomes repetitive and it doesn't work, that's often when it can lead to an addiction, especially when you have a, a the high octane neurological concoction of pornography and master, all that stuff together. It's very neurologically impactful. But if there's no shame, there's no compulsion, meaning I'm not frantic for my soul to be back at peace. Yes. Break that down a little bit more. Yeah, and and the, the shame isn't always just about the the sexual the sexual sin. There's a deeper shame, you know, like he, he was talking about and and this is true as in anybody's compulsion. He was talking about the places where he didn't feel like he was attractive to girls. He was talking about the places where he felt like he was kind of on the outside with kids. Uh, yes. You know, there are probably deeper shame in childhood stuff that we didn't get into. But uh, all of those areas are places where I don't believe I'm lovable how I am. And so what happens is here's a person that you desire. And in the fantasy and pornography is somebody who desires you, who wants you. That's good. Right. And And in that being desired in a place where you feel undesirable, that's part of what triggers the compulsion. But then there's another side of it. Uh, Jay Stringer in Unwanted talks about this, how we tend to repeat our trauma in our shame so that, you know, somebody who's been sexually abused may go hold on to the shame of sexual abuse and continue to go back. This wasn't part of Matt's story from what I could tell, but mm -hmm. uh, somebody with sexual abuse may, may go back and in their fantasy relive that abuse over and over again. Uh, mm -hmm. For a man it's oftentimes it's giving him a sense of power over a sense of powerlessness, which is also a place of shame for a man, sense of inadequacy. And so the shame is driving the story. Yeah. yeah. You're making the link, I think, which is really, really important when we talk about recovery and healing from specifically pornography. It's important to get deep enough in the heart to actually address the things that are driving the compulsion of looking at pornography and masturbating on a very regular basis. So many people 
are just about stopping the behavior of pornography and masturbation. That's like the only thing they're thinking about. But the analogy that you and I use all the time, and it's all it's in your books, it's in the courses, et cetera, is about a tree analogy of you can pluck fruit off of a tree, but it'll just keep growing back. You have to get into the root systems. And so uh, Matt did, a, I think, just a really fantastic job. I actually wrote them down because they were so powerful. Here are the things he said about his life that would be what you and I would call in the roots that are growing these fruits. This is the stuff where the shame was rooted. He said, I always felt like I was in trouble and that he's talking about his home life. So just, just that experience for a moment. I feel like I'm always in trouble. I can never get it right. Mom and dad are never pleased with me. Man, that's a massive source of shame. And you're very young and very impressionable. There's a lot going on there. He said also, I felt like the problem child. He said, it felt like my dad was always angry with me. I couldn't help but annoy people. I felt like a freckly weak kid. Yeah. Those are all shame statements right there. Yeah. And the, and the thing I loved about Matt's story is that he could articulate those. And he could put his finger on those as like source origin type places of where all this other stuff grows out of. I mean, Bob, how many times have you and I heard people say, oh, it was in the past. It's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. It was in the past. Like, um, and, and sincerely, you know, yeah. sincerely people saying, My, I had great parents. My parents, they were awesome. And, and what the comparison is often in those cases is to parents in jail, for example, like, well, my parents were never in jail. My parents, uh, they didn't scream at each other. My dad didn't physically abuse my mom, whatever. And so I don't have anything in the root systems is often the belief. And Matt was really careful. He, he was saying, I can't tell you whether it was my response to how they treated me or the way they treated me, but I felt that way. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, in some ways, we call that the subjective experience. In other words, that's how I experienced it. It may not have been objectively what occurred. Yeah. And uh, I know Ed Smith and, you know, Transformational Prayer Ministry talks about if it feels like it's true, it might as well have been true because that's what you interpret and run with, yeah. you know? Yeah. So again, sexual compulsion, so often we're just trying to cut the weed off at the top and you just cut the, anybody who's done any gardening, the worst thing you can do if you're pulling weeds is just take the leaves off. It's like the, the weed goes, woohoo, now you just made me stronger, right? Yeah. You're just, and that's exactly what goes on in the heart with these kind of areas. So getting deep enough, I think is so valuable. And what are those core beliefs that usually are rooted in wounds? Again, back to the anatomy of a wound. Yeah. And I, I loved how two things that he talked about as as he was sharing, one was at the end his his gratitude even for his journey and and for for all of this that you could hear the freedom of shame you know that he wasn't yeah. he wasn't he was careful I'm not, I'm not celebrating pornography at all I'm right it's it's an enemy and I hate it yeah but I'm grateful for my journey with pornography because it's led me to where I am now and into yes. my deeper healing and so the recognition of him being able to see that all the things he was doing in the past, including all the prayer activities that helped because it was dealing with the warfare, that they didn't get down to the roots. But the the recognition that as he began to address the fruit of this in his life, how God was so faithful to bring him down to the roots and to bring healing and to bring him into deeper intimacy with Jesus in that. Right. And, and isn't it interesting that that is exactly – Christ's mission, right? I think one thing that you can, that I think happens when people start to use the word in Christendom, people start to use the word healing. We, we narrow it. Mm. We, we truncate what it actually means. And so we go, oh, well, healing means I stopped the behavior. Uh -huh. I was healed of pornography, right? That's often the language that's used, but that is not at all what Matt was describing and not at all, uh, well, sort of, but it's not what we're emphasizing here at Real healing is the pornography problem can actually get you to the source of the issue. And that's where healing, it's the whole tree, not just the bad fruit. You know, it is the behavior, but it's also the wounds. Yes. And and oftentimes it's the fantasy that leads you to the wound. What do you mean? 
that oftentimes what, as I've worked with people over the years, as they fantasize about a particular porn- pornographic image or a particular memory or a particular situation, and they that's where they act out sexually. Yes. In that fantasy is contained the unmet need, a holy desire, but also their wound. Almost always you can find the wound through the fantasy. So whatever the fantasy is, it's like an inner vow Hmm. uh, protecting against the wound that's the very opposite of that fantasy. So if somebody's fantasizing about a beautiful woman who desires them, as an example, Underneath that is a place of feeling undesirable and not wanted and not good enough and yes. helpless. Yes. So the very opposite, you know, there's instead of the helplessness, the person's now in control of the fantasy. Yes. And this beautiful woman, unlike in life, is attentive to me the way she's looking at me, the way she's desiring me. Right. She's beautiful, somebody I'm attracted to. And right. Now she gives me everything that I want in my fantasy as opposed to I didn't get anything that I want in these places of my need. That I mean, it's Bob, you're hitting something that's so important that right there, I think, is why it's so addictive. Yes. You can't do that same type of thing with alcohol. Alcohol doesn't have that capacity to relate or at least... Uh, give the illusion of relating like pornography does, even like romance novels or whatever, all that domain. Yeah. 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 So, you know, what alcohol does like masturbation and pornography, it it gives a euphoria. It takes away the pain for a minute. So it becomes that aspect is there too, which is yes. whatever pain comes up becomes part of the compulsion to whatever yes. the addiction is. But in this particular case, there's a clue that's given in the fantasy that reveals the wound. Yes. I mean, it's something that I know it, it feels um, maybe scary, maybe tenuous, That, but I know when you and I have worked with people in this area, one of the areas that with a lot of prayer, a lot of discernment, and a lot of prudence, we step into those areas with the person we're working with because of the clue. In other words, you yes. can find the wound quite quickly and easily when you understand what they're desperately longing for in the compulsive behavior, um, it reveals itself quite easily. And and the way you described it, I think, is very simple. Like, oh gosh, I never felt loved, but here I can manage the situation and I'm given back the feedback, the illusion of um, intense love. Yeah. And the problem is it's not real that that's that's the where the massive diabolical yeah. thing goes into it none of it's real it's not actually a relationship it never satisfies yeah and and there's where you talked about the cycle of shame and compulsion repeating itself over and over again oh my gosh it kind of worked because and matt said this he goes it did work for a very small amount of time. In other words, like alcohol or any other substance, yes, the pain went away for a moment because I had a neurological burst of something. And I got the illusion that the wound has been changed or something new's happened in its place. But because it's not actually real, that wears off very quickly. Then you bump back into the shame. And now you're not just like to use Matt's words, like he was saying, you know, I'm always in trouble. I'm just a weak, freckly kid. Now I'm even more in trouble and I'm even more annoying. I'm even worse off right. than I was before the compulsion. Right. Because the shame says I'm bad and unlovable and undesirable. Right. And and I've just now reinforced that message. Yeah. This is the the diabolical, cyclical nature of these kinds of dynamics where the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. He knows the the addiction cycle. That's a, a more clinical phrase that people describe of going through, a, you know, a behavioral pattern of addiction and, you know, your triggers, et cetera. And, and Matt even mentioned how valuable that was to him to become aware of his addiction. I think he was talking about Dr. Kevin Skinner and some yeah. of his work about just understanding addiction, Yeah, that that was helpful in his recovery. Yeah. And if I can just lay out that addiction cycle, it's, you know, you start with a place of isolation. Yes. Uh, where their legitimate needs aren't being met because you're withdrawn. Yes. And almost all addictions start with isolation. And and then the isolation 
comes from shame, sense of this part of me, even if I'm with people, this part of me is not acceptable. So I feel alone even if I'm with people hmm. because nobody really knows me because I don't want yeah. to reveal who I am. They don't here. know all of me. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a real sense of aloneness and shame there. And then the shame triggers the compulsion, the hunger for that to be satisfied, satiated, needed. And then the acting out and then the shame that comes in, the self-hatred, self-condemnation, shame comes in, increasing the isolation, and then you stay in that cycle. Yes. As opposed yeah. to the joy cycle, which is I have communion, I'm known and I'm loved, uh, therefore I feel lovable, therefore I can be self-giving, which increases my joy, which increases my self-giving. And whether we have a compulsion to masturbation and pornography or all of us know those two cycles. Yes. Yeah. Very true. I mean, there's just so much here. And I think the thing I just want to pause for our listeners, just take a breather. Cause I'm like, Whoo, there's a <laughs> lot that we're throwing out there is that working through an addiction and especially a pornography, sexual addiction, because this is so common, you can't just stop at the surface. It, it, if there's any hope of healing, it has to get below the surface into these deeper dynamics of why I'm drawn to that. Because another way to say it is a secure person who knows they're loved, who knows they're going to be okay, who knows that no matter what, they'll have community and be cared for, their compulsions are very low usually. The, that's how you can manage temptation better because there isn't a lot of footholds for the enemy to get. But when you have woundedness, which is all of us, and sometimes it's really intense, and then that woundedness is linked to sexuality, like for Matt's story, my story, your story, a lot of others, when it's very young. So simultaneously as the wounding is going on when you're young, you're also exposed to this really intense, overwhelming as you're a kid experience what feels like like ecstatic love. Uh -huh. And so you put them side by side and go, so that's where I go get the thing I'm really longing for. Yep. Because I can't get it in this normal place. And I can't survive without it. Yeah. Yeah. And so the the lie, the message comes in there. This is how I will actually stay alive, find satisfaction, be happy. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that's not even being articulated. It's kind of, I keep falling, I want to stop. I'm a bad person. I keep falling, I want to stop, I'm a bad person. Now, I think this can segue us into something that Matt said that I I was just so grateful that he put words to it because he said, when there's unsophisticated ways of trying to stop these desires, and I really appreciated his unsophisticated because he was nuancing what I was just listing, yes. not going below the surface. Then he said, you're left with these three options. One, well, God then must not exist yes, because I'm asking him to take it away. I'm begging. I'm doing all the right things. I'm praying my rosaries. I'm whatever. And it's not changing. So it leads you to concluding, well, then God must not exist. Or God doesn't actually care, so he's not good. Or I'm just that bad. Yeah. And I thought those were brilliant experiences of anybody who's navigated any kind of sexual addiction, compulsion in a Christian context. I've heard, I mean, Bob, how many times have we heard this? I've begged God to take this away and he doesn't do anything. And that is such tender, precious places in the soul because you're right on the cliff's edge yes. of going, I think I'm the heck with God. God. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that, that with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you're identifying there is the hopelessness that sets in from a rejection and abandonment wound that gets projected onto God, right? Very good. And Can you break that down a little bit more? Yeah, it, it's just the words you're saying. God doesn't care yeah. about me. Rejection. God doesn't exist. Abandonment. Hmm. Uh, this is hopeless. It's never going to change. Hopelessness. So, right. so those three wounds, which are part of the story that lead to the compulsion get reinforced in relation to God now. They get projected onto God, hmm. right? And yeah. then the church can be part of that shaming or the spouse or the friends or whoever, which is, you know, just get over this. This is, right. you're a bad person for doing this. Uh, you must not be trying hard enough, all that. Oh, gosh. Yes. And, and that shame then 
actually increases the compulsion, even if it's even if it's fearful. You know, even if it's yeah. in fear, it's increasing the compulsion. I think one little footnote I'd like to make for all of our listeners out there who are priests: the sensitivity is really important in the confessional when the compulsion keeps coming back, because what the person's bringing into the confessional is not just the sin. They're bringing their whole self into the confessional. And so when you talk about the church kind of helping or hurting or contributing or just remaining stagnant in the whole healing process of the compulsion, when, let's use Matt as an example, when Matt goes to confession about this, he's expecting his a response like his dad. Oh, you've screwed up again. Like Matt's words again were like, I'm a problem child. They're always angry with me. I can't help but annoy people. So he's anticipating that from the priest. That's what projection is. I had this experience with another person who was very formative. Now I just kind of think that everybody's going to be like that, especially as I show my darker, weaker sides. And so in the confessional, when a priest might just kind of sigh, just be like, "Ah," that can absolutely wreck a person because they think, oh, that's exactly what my dad would do. This means that they don't like me. Oh my gosh. And then they go, I can't go back here. And so just a footnote to our priests, like it's such a hard, hard job to have that, be in that space in the confessional. And yet the sensitivity required is very high. Like you've got to be on your A game in those settings because lots of dynamics going on in the confessional. Yeah. I think of two scriptural examples as you're talking. I think of the woman caught in adultery and mm-hmm. Everybody's got the stones throwing at her, and she's living in even more shame. And and Jesus bends down and then says, he who's without sin, throw the first stone. And then looks at her and says, has nobody condemned you? Neither do I not. Con- neither do I condemn you. That's a message that every person who struggles needs to hear from Jesus. And then Jesus says, go and sin no more. Amen. He doesn't say it before. He says it after. Yes. Right. And that matters. Yes. And and so yeah. that's the healing. Nobody is saying pornography. Nobody in our conversations is saying pornography yes. is a good thing. Keep doing it. Right. Right. But we're saying be careful of how that message is communicated so that it doesn't reinforce the shame, which becomes the fuel for it to create this tension inside. It's allow that person to know how deeply loved they are even in the midst of their sin. And then the freedom to not sin uh, mm-hmm. and the command not to sin. You know, that that it is sin. But sometimes with a compulsion, the sin was way back here before the child was even of the age to recognize they were getting into the sin and now they're trapped in the sin and it's Satan who's now reinforcing that whole thing. So yeah. that image and then the image of the, the father with the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son's been involved in if you will, sexual immorality. And yeah. the father comes and greets him and doesn't tell him about his sin. He just wraps his arm around him and, and embraces him and restores him. But the son yes. was also done with it. So, yes. you know, there's a part of that, that that each person has to get done, has to hate their sin, yeah. has to hate hate the thing that they're been, as Matt said, they have to uh, break, break up, break with, up with their lover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like Donald Trump. Like you're fired. You yeah, know, like yeah, you yeah, gotta you yeah. gotta fire this thing. It's because it's actually not working. It's not. And yeah, and and I loved how he said in that there's a grieving process because you really hoped and thought it would work, and for years it maybe was a, a survival tool, right? If you're in the midst of a difficult upbringing or even a normal upbringing, but there's just lots of shame at home. Again, I think I just want to keep emphasizing, as soon as you say difficult, people go, oh, my parents were in jail. I'm fine. No, like everybody experienced levels of shame and that impacted you. I love how you say it, Bob, in the courses that we do. Anything that's not love is wounding. Yes. And any place where we haven't experienced genuine love, we take in shame. Just like that alone recalibrates the examination of my story. Yeah. Yeah. Any place there was not love, I was wounded. And and I know the internal world of people goes, what the heck? Then I've got wounds all over the place. And how in the world? And, and we can get overwhelmed by that. And this is exactly where Jesus comes in and says, take heart. In other words, 
This is why you and I can't imagine doing healing work apart from the capacity of Jesus Christ. Right. Because he can handle it all. When you remove him, I, I get overwhelmed. Yeah. I don't know how. If And that's, uh, to me, a good indicator. Do I get overwhelmed by my sin? It's a decent indicator of whether or not I truly trust and believe that God is close, he cares, and he desires to do something about it. Because if he does, then okay, at least I've got hope yeah. because he's around and he doesn't disqualify because of sin. He calls the sinners. I've come not for the righteous, but for sinners. I want the sinners to come to me. Yes. I, I, the scripture that comes to mind when you were just talking there was Lazarus. He asks for the tomb to be rolled open, huh. knowing there would be a stench. Yeah. <laughs> he knew. He's like... They're like, uh, he, roll away the stone. And they kind of go, uh, do you know what's behind there? And he is absolutely clear about what is behind that. And he's he flinches none Yes, in response to that. That's the appropriate picture. And the stench isn't coming from Lazarus. He's coming from his dead body. So Amen. in pornography, the stench is coming from the death, from the sin, not from the person. And okay, so there's somebody people go, but I am my sin. I can hear, I can yeah. hear people saying that, right? And right. but this is where Paul, the New Testament theology of the Paul, says, it is not I who sin. Yes. And people go, but but I did. Yeah. It's me. It's all me, right? And yeah. there's a shame dynamic, right? It's the sin in me. Right. Right. So again, understanding sin from the standpoint of our will cooperating with the deception of the enemy. Yep. Who planted a seed who then sets a trap from a foothold to a stronghold, and then we're bound in it. And then then he brings in the condemnation and accusation. This is so much what happens in a pornography addiction. Yeah. And and it's yeah. in these deepest areas of, of the heart. So it's it's yes. it's well embedded. Bob, maybe we can take a little bit of a uh, a turn here and start uh, answering and discussing the question of what does healing like? Like what what is required? What do I do? You know, again, statistically, there's a lot of people out there who this is a common big struggle in their life, and so maybe we can start listing again. Not exhaustive. One of the things I really liked about what we said with in the episode with Matt is the silver bullet. There's such a temptation to find the silver bullet. Matt shared about it's consecration to Mary that solves it all, and the the interesting thing is he's not wrong that that's important, right? It's just not, that's not the thing. And then you do that one thing and then all your problems go away. We're always looking for late night infomercials about our problems yeah. to just go, oh, 1995, get the weird thing. <laughs> okay, I don't really understand it. It doesn't seem like it'll work, but if I do it enough, yeah. right, that's just not reality. So maybe we can start breaking that down a bit of what is part of the healing journey. And I'll, I'll kick us off. We've just said a whole bunch of it. So I'll just try to summarize that. You have to get below the surface. Right. Where, like, um, Bob, we talk about, I think it's in, yeah, it's in other episodes. Uh, I can't, maybe you can remember where we break down the seven deadly wounds. That That's the kind of depth that we're talking about where you're quite aware of where you've been wounded in these primary areas. Can you just list them for us again? The seven deadly yeah. wounds? Abandonment, rejection, fear, powerlessness, hopelessness, shame, and confusion. Yeah. So those are the primary areas we are wounded, ways in which we're wounded. We have to get into those areas which are below the compulsion. Compulsion equals sexual addiction, masturbation, pornography, whatever is up there. Yeah. That's the bad fruit. We have to get in the root systems into those wounded areas and the beliefs for healing to occur, which ends up stopping the compulsive behavior. In other words, if you don't go deep enough, It'll just grow back. Yeah. It'll just come back. So that's one big topic about how to recover. What, what are other things that are, are critical? Well, I think in Matt's story, you talked about the importance of finding safe people to share with. Yeah, it was community. C yeah. Community yeah. and being received and accepted and being able to share your story. So whether, right. whether that's a 12-step group or whether that's a, a confession or whether that's uh, just a therapist who understands or a yes. few friends, that's really critical. Uh, it's, yes. it's difficult in relationships and marriage for either the man and woman who's involved in pornography to do that with their spouse because it's hurting the spouse. And and so there needs to be a level of honesty, but not necessarily 
the in-depth sharing about it uh, because it can hurt the spouse more. But going to somebody who can hear in depth and love the person in that place and help them walk through those places. And so we talk about in our holy desire, we said behind every disordered desire, and this is the healing process, Mm -hmm. we need to find the holy desire. because Behind the shame is a holy desire. Behind, Behind the compulsion is a good desire. People often have a hard time finding it, but that's really critical to find. What's the holy desire? The holy desire is a desire for God, desire for communion, desire for connection, desire for love. Yeah, that's driving the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's the unmet need? How do I identify whether those needs are being met and not met in my life currently? Hmm. And then the unhealed wound, which I said before, is where the compulsion shows us, the fantasy shows us where the unhealed wounds are. You know, yes. and, and in prayer, discovering that and bringing healing, which is allowing God's love and truth to come into the place of the distortion, the identity distortion, and the wound at the at the place where they originated. Yes. And then the hidden pattern of sin, recognizing that there's all kinds of patterns of sin that are hidden there. Yes. Not just envy and shame and lust. I mean, envy and lust and and anger and all those things, but places where our hearts have disconnected from God and we've become self-reliant yes. and and being able to become dependent again in those places where that trust broke and we formed resentments, that kind of stuff. And one of the things, Jay Stringer, again, book on wanted, we could probably put this in the show notes. Yeah. Um, he talks about is always before lust, there's a broken relationship somewhere. Wow. And that broken relationship is facilitated by these hidden areas of anger, resentment, unforgiveness. Wow. And so even as a young child, those things get formed. And be healed when I talk about John's story. I talk yes. about him as a two-year-old forming these areas of anger, resentment, unforgiveness, and envy for his sister who had what he didn't have mm-hmm. and how that set him up. And you say, well, two-year-old isn't responsible for sin, but the effects are still the same. When we yes. disconnect our hearts because of a trauma and we build resentment and unforgiveness, the effects are the same. So the healing process needs to touch all of those, including yes. the moment where the where the sin was entered into. Yes. Because that becomes a doorway to the demonic. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, Bob, as you're saying this, I'm writing, uh, I'm just writing keywords because I uh, I'm I know what you're saying and I'm trying to be a bit of a translator for our audience. So here's here's kind of like five or six things that you just said I think are really important. One is awareness. Yes. You just described a process whereby I'm understanding my story. I'm coming into awareness of of my life story and the various things that happened that were whatever. And included in that unholy things and holy things that are deeper. John Paul II calls that the heritage of our heart that is deeper than the sin that we commit. Yes. And so right there you're saying most and most people stop at the unholy desire. And that is where that that doesn't facilitate healing cuz my unholy desire is uh compulsion or I I you know looking at pornography let's say. Um but the that's the unholy. The holy desire is to be accepted. And if I can't honor the holy desire and become aware of it, healing is going to be really hard. So there's an awareness process of holy things and unholy things that are going on in my soul and in my story. Another one you talked about was truths. I have to have truth come in. So Matt has to know and experience and hear the truth that he's not just a weak, freckly kid. Yes. That that's not actually true, that he's just an annoyance. He has to hear the truth, and I am, here's, that's a second category, third category is experience. He can't just hear it. He also has to experience that he's not just a weak, freckly kid. Yes. And so whatever the lies are or the beliefs are, we have to be aware of them, experience that have truth said and experience that truth, which is absolutely critical. Then another one is strengthening. And what that means is like the development of the capacity to say no. So what Bob and I are not saying, listeners, is oh, if I just become aware and I invite Jesus into things, poof, it all gets better. No, there's there's also a part of the development of the capacity within us to say yes and no. 
So that might be likened to formation, development of virtue. I call it strengthening the will, developing the will muscle. Things like fasting. Fasting, and you take fasting, you put it in this healing process in the wrong context, and you interpret it as punishment because I'm bad. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what it's supposed to be at all. It's supposed to be an exercise whereby your will muscle, which has been weakened over time, is slowly strengthened. And so your yes and your no actually have weight to them. You, you actually mean what you say. So, so again, awareness, truth, experiencing, strengthening. Another one that Matt mentioned and that we you were mentioning just right then was warfare. Understanding I'm in a world at war and there are things I have to do to protect myself, my heart, my life that are purposeful and intentional of keeping the enemy at bay and all of the suggestions that he throws at me and all the ways that he tries to come at me, managing and doing spiritual warfare. And then I think the last one, it's a process. So many people want the silver bullet microwave experience, drive through relationship, drive through healing. I'm just going to order it up at the conference. I went to see Bob. I talked to Jake. This is going to be the thing. I spent three days with them. Come on, big money. Nothing. And it doesn't come and they go, well, I'm a, what did I do wrong? What? The problem is that there's not an acknowledgement of the process that goes into this. Here's one of the things I like to say with process. If you asked me years ago when I was right in the midst of my recovery and healing with sexual addiction, I, I wanted God to just come with, with the, the magic crozier, not a magic wand, we'll call it the magic crozier, and just boom, tap me and everything goes away. What would have happened if that had actually occurred? And, and now I can be honest about it. I would not have a relationship with God because I would have used him as a divine vending machine to get my happy treat life back. And I would never have grown in real dependence and relationship on him. And so the question becomes, when you ask, what are you actually asking for? What are all the layers that are going in when you're asking God for healing? It could be, I just want the shame to go away. I don't really want a relationship with you, God. I just want the shame to go away. And so here's the great irony. It's very possible that the compulsion is the only thing keeping you connected to a relationship with God. And it's very possible that healing that compulsion could end up being worse for you in the long run of a life of discipleship. Now, I know that might sound crazy, but that is very possible that your compulsion is the one thing that keeps you close to the Lord and the slow process develops relationship instead of just magic crozier's making things go away. Yes. And and I think Matt was saying that when he was saying, I'm now able to be thankful that the Lord brought me closer to him through this struggle to overcome my compulsion. Now, what you're not saying, and we'll just be clear because some people yeah. may inter misinterpret that, you're not yeah. saying it's okay to keep acting out because that's yeah. going to bring you closer to God. No, that'll bring you farther away from God Amen. to keep acting out. Uh, Amen. Yeah. But your struggle to get freed from acting out, it's a real struggle that you're engaging in with your will. Yes. You're getting help, you're bringing it out into the light, and you're still struggling. Be patient with yourself Yes. that this is a process and that God's at work and doing much more than you can perceive in the situation. He's not abandoning you. He's working yes. with you and in you. And yes. some people get free from the behavior pretty soon, Yep. right? Uh, they have filters on their computers. They get rid of their computers. They have people that yep. they share with. But, you know, it's it's like what you talked about before. It's like the dry drunk. You know, it's like getting free of the addiction is only the beginning of the process. It's not the end of yep. the process. And God wants God's intent on the whole process. Bob, that is my journey. A lot of people have heard my story and gone, oh, my gosh, it's so amazing. He stopped pornography addiction. He hasn't fallen in 20 years, whatever. That actually, that's not the story. The story is the compulsion stopped. The stuff below the surface is still, I'm still experiencing healing. Now, I'm way different than when I was 20 years ago. But when you say, oh, I was healed, you're, exactly what you're saying, I think, is so important. Yeah, the behavior might stop. The heart work is really deep. I, there's one more category, and I know, Bob, you've written a whole book on this, but it's kind of an obvious one, but I don't want to miss the obvious, is grace. The simple thing is you got to do things and be in places that dispose you to grace, where you get grace. The most, the biggest, highest, most powerful one would be sacraments. Yes. Eucharist confession. 
Those are big time. Now, for married couples, that is a sacrament that, that is giving you grace. So how do I activate the grace of my marriage? Here's a very simple tool. Renew your wedding vows. N not necessarily with your spouse, but yeah, you can do that too. Every morning, recommit to your wedding vows. Begin the process of, st of praying with your spouse, asking God to activate the grace of the sacrament. The grace of my marriage sacrament is easily the reason that I sit here today. So that sacramental grace was huge. Confession was another one which was huge. And mass and the Eucharist was huge, but also prayer time. Taking prayer time, being doing things where grace happens, right? So that's your whole book of, you know, why don't you speak to that? Like the whole sacramental domain and all of that. Yeah, that be transformed is right. just talking about the grace of the sacraments. And there's this cooperation between our capacity to receive grace and the grace that's freely given. And the grace that's freely given helps increase our capacity. And as we go through healing, why why the sacraments by themselves don't typically free us yep. is our hearts have to have the capacity to receive that grace. And so the healing process with the sacraments, uh, the grace then has a place to be powerfully implanted in our hearts and in our yeah. lives. And again, the grace is always offered. It just, yes. you know, it's like we, it's an ocean and we have a little thimble in our hearts yep. and we yeah and sometimes the thimble's full yeah and sometimes it's full yeah <laughs> yeah like of I, other stuff that, yeah yeah of other of other junk yeah, right yeah. and then you're you, then you grow to a bucket then you grow to a like a a big i don't know big something else big swimming anyway, pool maybe yeah. swimming pool there you go yeah bob we're kind of we're getting close to time here i i think uh, one thing i want to say then i, I want to let you have the last word is this episode to me has felt really it's like like supercharged fire hose water yeah. that's extremely rich to drink. And so I just want to really encourage, as I'm listening in my mind to everything we just said, there was a lot we just said. So I want to encourage our listeners, you might need to listen to this episode three, four, five times just to let yourself marinate in it. Don't expect, I listened to it once, it happens, and now that's just that's just not the process. That's not how people work. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, I would recommend Unwanted by Jay Stringer. I would recommend our Holy Desire material that yeah. we do through the center. Book Be Restored and yep. Restoring the Glory. Uh, those are all resources to help in this process. And yep. uh, the the podcast that Matt did, his interview with uh, Father Sean Kokali, is also yep. excellent uh, along these lines. There's probably a lot of other resources too, but uh, those are the things that come to mind. Yeah, I, I would really emphasize Bob your books and uh, like be healed, be transformed. I mean, there's there's a lot in there that we just skip the surface right over. And so if people want to even sink deeper, that that's the value of of all the work that you've done in those areas and domains. Other other episodes that we've done, right? Yep. This this felt like a linking episode where it required some understanding of other things, but when you pull it together, you know, you can really you can really see transformation happen, you know. That's why we keep doing what we're doing because things actually can improve. You know, if nothing ever changed, you and I would be like the biggest laughing stock yeah. in the world. But yeah. because things transform, then, you know, glory is restored. Yes. We, ha we have seen it. So both for those of you who are struggling and those of you who are living with people who are struggling, there is freedom. There is healing. There is hope. This is not a hopeless, endless process, even though we talked about all the pieces of the process. We didn't mean to make it sound like it's going to be 20 years before you have any freedom. That's not true. That's tr okay. Yes. Uh, exercise your will. Yes. Love yourself and each other with God's mercy as best as you can. And be dedicated, as, as Matt was saying, you know, if I had cancer, I'd do whatever I could to get free of the cancer. Do whatever you can to get free because your will is important in the freedom. Bob, I think that's a great place to, to stop. Listeners, thanks for being with us. And um, we mentioned all the resources and it's our prayer that you would continue to experience the healing love and mercy of God.